welcome to the Theology Pugcast. It's great to have you back with us, and we are back in a pub. We've been in a pub a couple times now, but I feel like I need to say that every time because, you know, we've done so many shows by Zoom. It's good to let folks know early on that we are actually live with each other, <laughs> even though we are virtually with them. Yeah, uh, now I think they could probably figure that out because there's no video. Yes, right. Well, that helps. Although some people, you know, don't actually have the video. They they don't watch us on YouTube, which is a good place to, this is a good point to, to let folks know. You can see us on YouTube when we have a Zoom episode anyway. And they probably know from the music too because I don't <laughs> That's think, right. I don't think That's any right. of us tend to listen to most of this when we're away. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Yeah, yes, that's very true. That's true for me. Anyway, I'm C.R. <laughs> Wiley. And I'm a pastor, and I've been a real estate investor, and I've been a, plus a professor of philosophy, and I've written things. But enough about me. Tom, how about you? Uh, Tom Price, a systematic theologian, Christian ethicist, teaching both at Gordon-Conwell Theological Seminary, and uh, I have been a guitarist. <laughs> All right. Yeah. In uh, fact, you, your, your degree, your, your my, bachelor's degree. My first degree. degree was in, yeah, uh, a, a split degree between um, uh, guitar a classical jazz guitar, and then a philosophy of education. All right, so, all right. Yeah. Cool. I didn't know about the philosophy of education yeah, side was a, of it. Yeah, Okay. I had a lot of credits. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, you got anything you want folks to know about? I know about that class, but it's probably yeah. too late. The, the arc is closed. Yeah, that uh, has finally closed, but it's been a good class through the uh, Fight, Laugh, Feast network, um, and it's really getting into some really good theological analysis of, of the trends, uh, intellectual and uh, behavioral trends of, of contemporary culture. And I got a lot of stuff, uh, other stuff on the burner, but that will be coming out sooner. All right. I mean, in the near future. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. We were talking about that. But we can't let anybody know because right. it would spoil the surprise. That's right. <laughs> All right, Glenn. I'm Glenn Sunshine. I'm professor of history at Central Connecticut State University, senior fellow at the Colson Center for Christian Worldview. And despite the fact that I'm a historian, my first degree was in theoretical linguistics. Yes. That's not a... guitar. <laughs> <laughs> guitar is much more interesting, I think, actually, or, or fun at least, but that's there you right. have it. That's right. Well, anyway, uh, that's good stuff. Anything you want to tell us about Glenn? How's the book going? I, I um, want to show something real quick to Glenn beforehand. A friend of mine sent th two things he got recently, same order. All okay. right, it's look at that. It's a picture of Glenn's book and a knife. All right. <laughs> he wants to slay Leviathan with that to knife. Slay Leviathan. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's it. I have a new book from Canon Press called Slaying Leviathan. It makes a great stocking stuffer. <laughs> and uh, I think it, uh, it seems to be doing pretty well. I haven't gotten any sales reports yet, but it seems to be doing pretty well in the last few weeks. Yeah, I've, I've checked the numbers occasionally, and it, uh, it, it really has. So that's good stuff. And you, you need to get out there today and buy a copy of Glenn's book if you don't have it already. But if you do have it already, you should buy it for other people because it needs, it, we need more people to know how to slay Leviathan. Absolutely. All right. Well, today is Glenn's day, but before we get to Glenn, uh, we do need to wrap up a little bit from uh, our sort of tie up a loose end or a loose couple of loose ends from our last show. And uh, our last show was on the Great Reset. And uh, in that, we talked about what our betters uh, have in store for the rest of us, which is essentially slavery and uh, on a global <laughs> scale and uh, using all of the marvelous devices that have been developed in Silicon Valley just for that purpose. But uh, it, it, it uh, had a, I think, a, a kind of a, well, I think we had at least one person who told us that, that it was kind of a downer, you know, in, in the sense that, you know, we had said in the show that we were going to give people a reason for hope, and then we didn't really get there. <laughs> so, so I'd like to, to begin with some thoughts on why we should have hope. And uh, here's what I have to say. Uh, the reason we should have hope is because we win. That's, right. That's why we should have hope. Christ is the one who has been raised and who has ascended and uh, who is seated on the throne right now. We don't put him there. Uh, it's something that has already uh, been revealed to us as, as being the, uh, you know, a, a fact. And even though we find ourselves in a, in a world in which we sometimes don't feel like there's a lot of evidence for that, um, we're still in the middle of the story. And you know, our Lord has a marvelous ability to bring good out of evil, order out of chaos, you know, unexpected endings uh, to pass, all of these different things. So uh, that is the, the fundamental reason for hope, not because we have a great strategy or because we know exactly what to do at this moment 
In fact, throughout Scripture, we're told again and again that people felt the same way we feel right now. And then just out of nowhere comes this m remarkable deliverance that no one could have anticipated or predicted. So that's my reason for hope. I don't know if you guys have anything you want to add. Um, interesting that, um, you know, I did my doctoral work on Karl Barth, and I mean, our audience, you know, different people may have different attitudes towards him, and that's fine, and I, I have differing attitudes on differing days. Um, <laughs> oh, are you on a happy day or a bad day when <laughs> it comes to Bart? <laughs> well, I always learned a lot from Bart, and I do think he, is, he was a, a genuine believer trying to go from the side we wouldn't want to be on to where we do want to be on, but one of the things that compelled him was his centering on Christ and the right. hope that is in Christ. And, I mean, he went through the uh, Second World War. He went through, actually, the first. That's He had a falling out, and he developed, was doing theology during this time. And they, they always said, why didn't he kind of lose his disposition at all with all that heinous evil around him? And they always said that he sort of just always shrugged his shoulder to anything evil and kept, kept his center on, on Christ. Um, and, and I think that is the way we have to look at evil and its attempt to to distract us from the fact that Christ is risen, right. is overcome, sovereign, sitting at the right hand of God. And this is, none of this is outside the parameters of God's purposes. And, and, and so, so what may be a downer is that, okay, maybe we, we have to uh, bear witness in a time of darkness. Well, right. that's what the church has typically been having to do. So maybe we had a long stretch where we didn't have to do that much. Um, but in a way, that's, as even Bart recognized, that's a sign of joy um, rather than, um, than, than uh, something to be despairing yeah. about. As a matter of fact, he, it was such a joy that when he was teaching his lectures on the Gospel of John in Germany at the time that the Nazis were coming in to check the classrooms to see if they said anything. Imagine against. if you had an SS officer in the back row of your class. Yeah, well, it's, it's like having like Twitter in the back of your class. <laughs> <laughs> and you do, and you do. And you There's do. some kid back there. <laughs> That's right. And you believe what this professor just said. But he never stopped uh, honoring Christ first, and he said, first of all, we're not going uh, to swear allegiance to Hitler in a class where Christ is going to be discussed. And he said, second, take your hats off in my classroom. <laughs> So, so uh, there, right. you know, there's a right. time that maybe that doesn't seem bold, but it, it, it could have been life or death at oh, a yeah, particular could, moment. Oh, yeah, it could lead you to the prison camp. Sure. And so I don't want to eat up time. But anyway, I, I, I think uh, we shouldn't lose hope even if there are challenges before us. We look to the hope that is in us and uh, resurrected right. and sovereign. I remember just, uh, just this past week I was listening to Nate Wilson say, you know, talk a little bit about this, and he said it's, it's not as though God doesn't have a history of uh, doesn't have a history of playing rough with his own church. <laughs> he does, you know, so, uh, but he's still God and he still has a purpose for the church, but sometimes he has to slap us around a little bit to get us on purpose. Anyway. Yeah, and what I would add is that I, if you think back to the, the film version of The Lord of the Rings, I, I try and, not to. Well, yeah, but, you know, and, and this is in this is in the original too. But I hear it in Ian McKellen's voice. Um, he, he he says to Frodo at one point, you know, the fact that the ring was found and that Bilbo found it, well, Bilbo was meant to find it, and you've got it now, which means you were meant to have it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that is an encouraging thought. Yeah, it is right. And and the 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 thing that that. I, I have to keep coming back to is that the times that we're in are not an accident on either level. Mm -hmm. In other words, it's not an accident that we are living in these times, and it's not an accident that we are the ones living in these times. Right. Um, we, we are, we've been put into the situation we're in, facing the kinds of challenges that we're facing, because we are uniquely called to be the people to respond in this situation. Hmm. And we may not have done as good a job as we should have preparing ourselves and things like that, but okay, you know, right. that's all right. We still go. We still move forward. We are the people who are called to respond to these challenges. Right, right. And that's an encouraging thought. And so I hope that uh, the folks who listened to last week's episode on the big or the, the great reset uh, will take some encouragement from that. And if you're wondering, what was that episode all about? You know, well, you can go back and listen to it. <laughs> anyway, and I have one, one last thing to say is I do love about one of the things I do love about sharing in this episode is whenever we need some commentary on what scripture teaches, 
probably the best form of commentary is a little commentary on the Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> That's, right. That's right. Speaking of that, so uh, Glenn, it's your day. What are we talking about? Okay, well, the place I was going to start, and I guess I will start, is with something I heard from Doug Wilson when I was out in Moscow speaking, speaking at New St. Andrews. He does a Sabbath dinner with his family, and they've got a little liturgy that they do. And in the liturgy, they summarize the Bible as, and I quote, kill the dragon, get the girl. Yes, I've been at one of those meals. I remember hearing him say the same thing. Right? And, and that idea of, of summarizing the Bible as kill the dragon, get the girl, it got me thinking about a whole lot of different things. Now, and, and for, so, those, for and, those who don't understand it, the girl is the bride of Christ. It's the church. Right, right. So, And, and the one who kills the dragon is Christ, and, and the dragon, of course, is, well, the dark lord. Yeah, Satan. Right. Okay, so j- just so we're clear that that's what's going on. <laughs> but, but what occurred to me, you know, when I heard that, it obviously connects into... Yeah, St. George and the Dragon. It, yeah, yeah. It, it, it goes into Norse mythology, Sig, um, yeah. Siegfried, right, um, right. on and on and on. There are example after example after example of this throughout mythology, throughout folklore. And that got me thinking about archetypes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That is, um, I, 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 I think that this was Lewis or somebody reflecting on Lewis said that all of the stories that are out there, all the really good stories, yep. are simply reflections of the great story. Mm-hmm. There's a book out there entitled uh, Seven Basic Plots. Mm-hmm. And according to, the, to, that, to that author, and I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but I've got the book and I've actually read the book. That's saying something. Because I've got a lot of books I've not <laughs> actually read. It have its own plot. That's <laughs> <laughs> but, but basically the, the point was is that universally, anywhere you look in the world, no matter, doesn't matter what culture you're talking about, there are only seven stories. Hmm. And maybe there's really only one what, is hmm. what you're getting at. Yeah. Well, it, in particular, I mean, there are all kinds of, of really, frankly, negative stories out there, yeah, you know, yeah. things like that. But when you're looking at at sort of the classic stories, the stories that, well, as Sam says, stick with you, mm-hmm. the, 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 those kinds of things. I, I found myself thinking, like I said, about this idea that how many of them do end up reflecting the gospel yeah, on, yeah. on one way or another? They're, they're, they're shadows, they're, they're pictures, they're parables right, of the right. gospel. Right. And so I, I thought that might be kind of an interesting idea to begin exploring. Well, let, yeah, let's step back a little bit because one of the things we like to do on the show is think about creation. And I think one of the things that we were just talking about, you know, before we turned on the microphones, is just how sort of sub-Christian most Christians dis- uh, sort of outlook on creation is. Yeah. They think of creation as sort of having no sort of inner structure, no sort of a telos or purpose or goal or meaning and that the only the only thing that creation is there for is to sort of do what we want you know that's right we impress our will upon it to make it do things that we want uh but what you're getting at here is that that sort of in the fabric of things or maybe in the script Mm -hmm. is uh, you know that that we have in creation itself there's a there's a kind of story being told yeah, and, and that's absolutely the case. Uh, scripture, I, I think, is abundantly clear on that point. Yeah. That, you know, even the idea that Christ came in the fullness of time yes. suggests that there is a, there is a plot, that there, there are things needed to develop. A plot needs to develop, and at exactly the right time, Christ comes right. and accomplishes redemption and then leaves us to finish the job much like God began creating the universe and then left Adam and Eve to finish the job. Right, right. So, you know, they, 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 they are sub-creators. There's a larger work of creation that, that is God's doing, and then they have something to do within that larger framework as sub-creators, as, as Tolkien would say. Right. And in fact, the, the term sub-creator comes from Tolkien's essay on fairy stories, right. where his the the climax of the thing it's a very interesting essay worth reading you can find it free online um, the climax of it is something that he does that you know people who are familiar with him you know kind of see yeah and just agree with it but it was a really audacious thing that he did he finishes it by saying the gospel itself 
is a fairy story in the sense that he's talking about it, except it's a true fairy story, just like with Lewis, he was talking about it being a true myth. Right. The myth myth becomes fact. Right. Yeah. Um, And so in in this particular essay where he's talking, but he's got a very specific definition of what he means by fairy story, um, but he says that, that those stories, the kill the dragon, get the girl type stories, are in fact um, reach their, their ultimate example in the gospel. And it's the ultimate example, not only because it is the most perfect of the stories, but also because it's true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's right. So all of these other stories are kind of expressions of the desire of the nations, as you like to say, Tom. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the, the fact creation on one end speaks, and it doesn't stop speaking, even despite the fall. Um, and I think this is one of the, the areas that is, um, it, you know, it enters up a whole world of things, and I'm not going to chase them. But one of the things is the modern conception of culture is very different than what a Christian conception would be rooted in, in sort of the, 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 you know, the fundamental determination of everything in Genesis, for example. Um, because the, the modern notion of culture tends to be, think of culture as nothing but the sign system of the human self. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, whereas this is after something far more, far richer, that uh, that in the memories and the stories of culture and the telling of stories and the whole story aspect of cultures prior to kind of you know the way in which cultures moved from that to to, to the modern world mm-hmm. um, is much more connected to the way we are actually in part of the grain of the universe um, than. Um, than the way the modernist would kind of look at culture and stories as, as something more than the expression of creative selves, that being the end of it. Um, you know, there's, there's a way of thinking about this that maybe would be, uh, it might help, uh, you know, people who are used to working with materials like wood and stone and so forth. So when we think about, uh, you know, our, um, our forebearers, our ancestors, they didn't have the kind of machinery that allows uh, you to just pulverize stuff, grind stuff into powder, hmm. and reform it. They had to work with tools with a limited range of, 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 of uh, application, uh, and the materials that they worked with would, would uh, be things that, you, that they, they looked to to help bring about whatever they're making. or sort of, sort of. So, for example, when a, when a carpenter was working with the grain, you know, there's a sense in which the grain, because it's moving in a particular direction, there's a sense in which it wants to, you know, there, the, the wood wants to behave in certain ways. So you work with the wood. Hmm. Now, today, you know, we have the power to just sort of grind stuff up and to turn it into MDF, medium-density hmm. fiberboard. Just break it down to almost an atomic level. I mean, I'm having a little fun here, but just down to particles. And then just mix in a bunch of glue, and you get a perfectly flat surface that has no sort of inner structure or character. And uh, you can sort of shape it and mold it to whatever you want. Same thing with stone. Uh, stone, various kinds of stone, you would work with the material and sort of bring to the surface its inner structure and highlight it and actually, not just from a standpoint of its beauty, but also its a sort of physical integrity, work with that to create what you wanted to make. But today, people don't think about the natural world, the creation in those terms. They have this modern sort of frame of mind in which uh, to make is... is uh, is, is to take everything to a kind of a silly putty level, sort of break it down to its, uh, you know, in, in such a way so that it can be molded and shaped entirely according to the whims or the, you know, we see this with like 3D printing. Now I've even seen 3D printing when it comes to like, uh, and, and, and this, is one of, this is one of these horrific things in my mind, as, 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 you know, with regard to like buildings. Hmm. So you have this gigantic robot I've actually seen these things in action, yeah, yeah. Yeah. where where you just three D uh, print a building using concrete, yeah, or yeah. cement, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so now there are a lot of folks who just say, "Oh, isn't this a marvelous thing?" You know, think about what this means for, you know, uh, providing shelter to poor people in different parts of the world because it brings down the cost of construction to to you know a much lower level. And I think, well, but you, you're forcing them to live in a 
in this just <laughs> horrific <A> storyless <laughs> universe. <laughs> yeah, and and I would actually there, there's a, a passage in On Fairy Stories that sort of speaks to that. Okay, which I will probably get to in a second. But before I do that. The other thing you have to keep in mind is it's not just when we're making things. It's when we're, well, creating ourselves, when we're making people. Yes. You know, when you, when you read The Lord of the Rings or when you read The Silmarillion, you find out that orcs are created, quote, unquote, by, by Melkor, Sauron's old boss. Um, he, he took elves and he twisted them. Hmm. Uh, it sort of uh, in mockery of them, and trolls are made in mockery events. Right. But they, you take something and you distort it, you twist it, you shape it into mm. what you want it to be, mm-hmm. rather than what it really is. Mm. Yep. Yep. That is our definition of identity today. Yes. Right. Your will imposed on mm. what is the nature of things that are in front of you. And one of the things that people that no one seems to question mm-hmm. is the purity of their desires. Right. So, you know, in Scripture, we, mm-hmm. we we're told that there are some desires which are mm-hmm. evil. Right. Yeah. And that they should be mortified. But we live in a culture today where, I mean, every desire can be, uh, you know, converted into profit. Yeah. Right. So, you know, you, you want to become the opposite sex? We can help you do that for mm-hmm. $35,000. Right. And, and the thing is, it, it, mm. it's a rejection of what is. It's a rejection mm-hmm. of biological fact. It's a rejection of natural telos, the natural ends mm-hmm. of, let's say, sexuality. But any number of other things that people pull out and they twist and they distort and basically... They're turning themselves into orcs. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and I think what I mean, one of the ways they try to justify it is they say, you know, well, we suffer from the naturalistic fallacy, right? Just because it, you know things should be a certain way doesn't mean they ought to. Um, but no, we actually we're actually making that challenge to them. No, just because you desire things to be that way doesn't mean you ought to. Actually, uh, creation speaking um, speaks not from a place of creation right now being where it's supposed to be, but both attesting to the fact that it has a certain nature and certain ends, but also that they have been distorted. And especially the, the gospel is the fuller story. Well, that, let's, let's, let's go back, though, those. to the naturalistic fallacy, because yeah. what you have is a question begging right there. That's right. What's, what, the, the very, the very uh, objection yeah. called the, you know, sort of labeled the, nat- the naturalistic fallacy yeah. uh, presupposes that there is no creator. Yep. That there is no purpose sort of given to things no that, measure. Yeah. That, that, that he's made. And so consequently you end up with a kind of atheistic kind of, uh, well, uh, ontology yeah. that's now informing a great deal of evangelical theology. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, and I think that is it. I mean, what Glenn's hitting to with, with you know, the notion of story. Now, um, I'm going to take it a little different direction at this moment, but I don't want to go far with this. Um, narrative theology and narrative thinking in hermeneutics, um, what is that? I don't want to go into a long history, but it really wanted to talk about something lost from the Enlightenment um, disenchantment with right. uh, creation. And it started to recognize that the way our psychologies and identities are developed are story-based, and so that that um, and and so they wanted to say the kind of the modern world kind of piv- uh, polarized two extremes. Um, one would be the the hyper rational, and therefore the cognitive and the propositional, like the fundamentalists. Right. T- and then well, the, this this is fun. This is when you reveal to fundamentalists that they're actually. You know, Rash, crypto, hyper, crypto right? yeah, crypto modernist. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the other extreme being the emotive liberal expressivist, right? Nothing, language and everything is nothing more than expression, uh, self-expression of. Um, the the narrative wanted to say, no, wait a minute. Both of those elements are true, but they're true within the narrative, and and I think they're they're right on that in the sense that that. Um, I mean, Scripture basically tells us that the fact that there is Scripture, which is a redemptive history, it is also it also reveals the metaphysics that govern it. Um, but the the rational and the propositional and the experiential and the encounter are all within that plot line. 
and, and I think that they were on to that. Their problem was they had a very non-realist approach to it, which yeah, meant they it wanted wasn't to, really connected to creation. Yeah, they wanted yeah. to be able to say that we can make the narrative say anything we want. Ultimately, mm-hmm. yeah. And then our narrative has... Um, and this is the reason why Star Wars is not worth anything anymore. Yeah, yeah. Because basically what you have is yeah. is early on, you know, you had the, you know, the, the very first Star Wars film and the second one, those were informed by... Well, the seven basic plots. You know, they, they actually... So what you have now in storytelling is, is I think, the, comparable to uh, atonal music. <laughs> you, know, the, you know, when you think about, you know, music in terms of scale and so forth, yeah. there's a structure yeah. that, with, that is a given and, yeah. that you, and you work creatively within that structure. But atonal music was the obliteration of, of scale, the obliteration of those structures with the sort of the arbitrary will, and so then you end up with just just the most awful sounding stuff, you know. Well, and it's interesting, and that 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 uh, in a way, uh, I always say uh, unwarranted associative leaps. <laughs> I always hear something you say, and it reminds me of something completely far off. But Glenn says that's what we do here, anyway. and that's right. So it makes us, that's what makes the podcast so interesting. But one of the things, and I hope this kind of swerves things back around, um, Genesis one, two, and three basically give us the rest of everything else. I mean, that I think that's reality yep, yep, and that's everything. Yep. So, one, two, and three, what do you get? A, metaphysics par excellence in history and therefore story par excellence. One, in the ultimate source of all things, um, God has life in himself, part one of Genesis. All creatures have life in God, part two. There's our create, uncreated, created being, mm-hmm. Um, that governs the rest of the story, and then the story, the covenant story, creation, fall, redemption, consummation. And so this whole frame from Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and all the distinctions, the kind of beings that there are, um, the, be- the fact of being, the kind of beings, and the purposes of beings, in- in- inform that whole story. That's right. Well, and if that becomes foundational, my argument would be, to everything about creation speaking. Well, any great, any great story, any good novel, uh, in some sense has the be- the end and the beginning. Yeah, yeah, and it's just kind of a matter of unpacking. Yeah, well, you know, it, it, to pick a a um, pop culture example, if you look at the Marvel films, what happens in every one of them? You have an origin story, creation. Yeah, in the origin story, you inevitably have the hero fighting himself. Mm-hmm. Mm. Okay, so you've got, in a sense, a fallen version, but a conflict w- really with himself in all cases. It's, an, it's a mirror image of himself or herself, and then a resolution to it, which then allows the hero to take their proper place on the Avengers or whomever. It's, it's the stock formula every single time, but it echoes in, not directly, but it echoes very much Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah, rich stuff. Now, I think that one of the things that people kind of recoil from is uh, when we when people start talking along these lines, people like us. Um, <laughs> there's a sense in which uh, there's a, a, a sort of the, I guess, the tincture of the pagan, and what I mean by that is mm-hmm. the idea that if a story is in, in wrong in any 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 one sense, then it's ruined in every sense yeah. in their minds. They just sort of say, well, that part was wrong, so we just have to throw out the entire thing. Yeah. So mm-hmm. that's why we can't you know, uh, you know, learn anything from uh, Greek mythology or something like that. We just, we just want to throw it all in the trash bin. But, but that's not what we're saying. No, absolutely not. Um, you know, C.S. Lewis talked about this, you know, when he said, you know, it turns out that I, I hate to criticize Lewis here, but it turns out that more recent research suggests that Lewis wasn't entirely correct here. But he says all of those mythologies about dying and rising gods, he says all of them are, you know, just because there are dying and rising gods in mythology doesn't mean that it's always false. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That those things were, you know, to use theological terms, they were a matter of common grace. Right. That people in those cultures got a sense, an inkling, a, an intuition maybe, about what was necessary for redemption. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And 
And, and then, it, then it actually happens with Christ. Now, the thing where, where Lewis went wrong is the number of dying and rising gods is nowhere near as large as it was believed to be in his day. Okay. You know, chronologically, most of those are actually post-Christian, but that, that's a different issue. Okay. And, and interestingly, you have there as well, you have sort of um, in the created order itself speaking even in light of the fall, because things falling to the ground and dying, mm -hmm. um, you have still something that becomes a formative set of ideas from the natural, you know, um, agriculture, grains, dying, coming to life, seasons, everything established in Genesis prior to the fall, and then the fact of the fall still testify to the incarnation, Christ, his redemptive work, and resurrection. Right. And so you... you I, I, I'm going to push that one step further. Okay. The, grade of the, great, the grain falls into the ground, it dies. Yeah. But then it bring, comes back to life. Mm -hmm. And out of that new life are the grain from which we make bread. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. Right, right. And so out of yeah. the resurrected life yeah. comes the thing that gives us life. Life. So yeah. what we're yeah. pointing to then is yeah. the sacramental view yeah. of, of the world, mm -hmm. which is one of the points that Tolkien makes about fairy stories. Yeah, yeah. That they take normal things yes. of, that, that occur in everyday life and infuse them with a new kind of meaning. Yeah, yeah. You know, a, a quick story. Um, we were... It, it's a it's a long story. I had I made a disastrous mistake when we were living in Germany, um, in arranging travel. Uh, we we had to go to a uh, page in Hungary, and so we took the train to Budapest, and I picked the wrong connection, the wrong way to get there. And it it long story, but <laughs> th they were supposed to have a, a you know we overnight train. So you you ended up in Moscow. No, welcome, no. comrade. <laughs> no, 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 we ended up in Page, but but, but we, they were supposed to have a um, a breakfast car on the train. So we got on the train. Eventually, found it. Got on the train. There was no food. And like I, I I had a ten year old and a seven year old, eight year old, seven, seven on the train. <laughs> And I'm thinking, I can't give them breakfast. They haven't eaten since last night. What am I going to do? And so I started, you know, we, you know, we, we searched the train, and I, I came back, and I said to him, okay, we're having an adventure. And you know what Bilbo says about adventure? They're nasty, unpleasant things that make you late for breakfast. <laughs> we're having an adventure. And I said that just to make light of the situation, to try to have the kids, you know, not... Not and they were great. They were troopers. They did they did really well. I found out just a few years ago that you know decades later that that really made an impression on Elizabeth, my oh. daughter, huh. and hmm. because she felt like at that point she was connected to the story. Okay, hmm. something the, the the thing that that fairy stories do, or fantasy does, mythology does is they take these common things of everyday life and they turn them sacramental. They mm -hmm. give them a higher or greater significance, right. even missing breakfast. Right, mm. right, right. Yeah, and you, you feel like you're participating in some larger story. Exactly. So, so one of the problems with modern stories, you know, is they're so sort of historically contextual and contingent and sort of mean they, they refer to nothing beyond themselves. So that even in the midst of the story, the hero or the heroine doesn't really feel like he or she is plugged into anything bigger than herself or himself. Mm -hmm. um, and while you know you can make a good novel out of something like that, uh, you, you, people are longing for a way to connect with reality in their lives now, here in this world. And I think we want to take it one step beyond that. They want to see that their lives in this world, in the here and now, mean something more than just their lives in this world, in the here and now. That's right. They well, want to go past fact to meaning, as I keep right. saying. Right. right. And, and, and it's interesting. I mean, it's a question I have kind of for Glenn as a historian. But before I do that, I have to give the audience a little description. If you haven't been to Europe and have not ridden on the train system, for example, um, when if you don't know the language well, you tend to hear this at every stop. <laughs> and uh, you usually have to ask somebody who doesn't completely understand your attempts to speak their language, what stop is it? 
So it's very easy to get on an adventure very quickly when you're traveling. I, I did very similar. <laughs> Especially when you're trying to deal with Hungarian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so uh, and I had it happen in Italy as well. I, I, I think I went around Italy about six times before I ended up where I needed to be. Um, but but uh, uh, the historian question would be this. Well, we often talk about, especially as, as Protestants, about sort of the historical grammatical emphasis of the, the meaning of the biblical text for itself, the biblical story, if you will. And there is a, a, a huge significance in that. But, but history, in the history of redemption, grounded in the whole story of Scripture, and then, of course, larger, the story of creation, um, that, you know, which, which Scripture unpacks for us, um, is oftentimes very different than what we would say the modern approach, the history that tends to, to be indebted to this history of fact and from, from the nominalist tradition, where it's the individual particulars of every given moment that have the only meaning. And therefore, Scripture has to kind of almost bring itself down into that world of just this particular, this particular, this socioeconomic situation, and that becomes the meaning frame for the biblical meaning, rather than the transcendental story of scripture, it's metaphysical, and then the covenantal history across time told in the story. So it's almost like, for example, if you were talking the Silmarillion, to understand um, the, the, the one particular aspect of that story, you'd have to go to Tolkien, everything that was going on in his historical situation, and everything else to get the meaning of that, rather than seeing actually what he ended up developing as a story and a plot line and, and a, a, a realm of the fairy, if you will. Yeah, and I, I would take that even further in that, you know, in the Middle Ages, they, they overdid this, uh, working out of, it ultimately goes back to a, a second century church father named Origen. But yeah. um, they believed that every passage of Scripture had four separate meanings, the literal, yeah. the yeah. allegorical, the anagogical, and the tropological. And yeah. I'm not going to bother defining those because it's not important <laughs> for present purposes. <laughs> that's but another show. That's another show. <laughs> but, 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 but the point was, you know, they, they, they shoehorned something into all four of those categories for every passage of Scripture. And it was obviously a, you know, uh, you, know you, you have to do some real gyrations to make that happen. Um, so when the reformers came along, you get Luther who says, no scripture has only one meaning, and that meaning ultimately is salvation in Christ. New Testament is mostly literal, Old Testament is mostly figurative, but it all points in this one direction. Okay. And so it's a Christological hermeneutic. And, and interestingly, Dave Steinmetz once said, uh, I remember his class on, on uh, we did a, uh, uh, and David Steinmetz, for those who don't know, he's a professor of uh, Reformation history. He's actually Richard Muller, if you know, if anyone in the audience knows him, his uh, prized teacher. But he once said that what the Reformation did is it took all those levels and put them onto the same level. So he said they okay. actually, they, he said he didn't get, uh, Luther and the rest of the early reformers didn't get rid of, per se, of all of them, but they put them on the same level. So I, I don't fully mm. understand that at this point. I yeah. just wanted to throw it out there. Well, what happens from there, though, is you begin pushing that idea of a single meaning of scripture. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, it, you, you see this with, um, you know, on some level, even with the Puritans, although not quite there yet completely. Mm -hmm. But then when you start moving toward early Enlightenment and Enlightenment rationalism, yeah. that's when this historical grammatical approach to reading the text takes over completely. And the problem with that is that you can spend so much time looking at the context and the details of what was going on when Jesus told this parable. Even if you're a good yeah. you know, inerrantist, yeah. you can spend so much time focusing on that that you miss the fact that the idea that there's only one way to read it is a modern distortion of the way people in the period understood scripture. And one of the things John Webster, my, super, my doctoral father said, is what ends up happening when, when that happens is um, the particulars of history that we want to force scripture into meaning are read in the level of naturalistic fact, not mm -hmm. as sign. Right, right. And in the whole Christian tradition, I mean, yes, it went, like you said, overboard with the sign at some points, but it lost the sign character of everything within, in, within 
within creation. So mm -hmm. no longer did the visible manifest the invisible attributes of God. Now all of a sudden, it was the visible that defined what was meaningful in and of itself, not in relationship to, to yeah. the larger. Uh, and, and, and one of the problems that you end up kind of getting into because of this trajectory is postmodernism, yes. which says you can't know the context so you can't know anything at all, yep. even at that level. Yeah. So you just think about the fact that you know, you're a historian, and, uh, uh, Glenn, and, and to know the context of a situation, the more you get into history, the more detail you discover, the sort of the richer it becomes, the more, I guess, overwhelming it can become. And then you get to this situation where I, I you know when I think about modern historians, nobody wants to do sort of the big picture history anymore nope. because it's, it's like a formula for being destroyed because <laughs> right. there, there's always going to be something that you'll, somebody knows that you didn't know. You'll be pecked to death by chickens. That's right, that's right. But you've got to have some kind of large picture. What is the Western tradition? There is a story here. Right. But, but because, because you can be pecked to, 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 you know, to, to death by chickens, nobody wants to go there. And then... That opens the door for the postmodernists yeah. who say, well, you know, the text is just entirely, you know, sort of at the sort of the beck and call of the reader. That's you know, right. whatever you want it to do and yeah. whatever you want it to say, that's the what, it's, what it is. the facts aren't signs, therefore they're facts, but facts, therefore, are, can be endlessly read, right. interpreted. Right. And, you know, the thing that I liked about what you said is that one of the things, there were several, but uh, the, the fact that you, you, create, you tied it not just to biblical exegesis, but to creation. Yeah, yeah. That creation itself points beyond itself to bigger and deeper realities. And yeah. we're back to teleology, we're back yes. to all of those things that we talked about so often. And my thing of a world of fact rather than a world of meaning. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we are in a world of meaning. Yeah. Um, just like the physical universe points beyond itself, the literal grammatical historical context of scripture, I would argue, also points beyond itself. Yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not just an interesting historical anecdote. Yeah. And yeah. One, one of the things, too, that happens is that, and this is just at our level, you yeah. know, so we've been talking about depth, we've been talking about height, but I'm just thinking about at our level, we have a tendency, because we think we have the sort of the, the final interpretation with regard to a scripture, we've closed ourselves off to the wisdom that we can can enjoy. Yeah, do you have any porters? Actually, unfortunately, we do not right now. No porters. Um, I do have some in a, probably a can, if you'd like. Yeah, what do you got in the can with porters? Yeah. There is a peanut butter milk stout. Ooh. Uh, uh, the drafts, unfortunately, aren't pouring. Oh. Is that what you've seen on the... Okay, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, it's not pouring at the moment. We had a little bit of a... Understood, understood. So if we have you, a BBC Coffee House Porter. That'll, I'll do that. Yeah, with a nice okay. cold glass. I, I yeah, that'd be great. That was out, so I hope it's still in, but I'll do a sea hag. A sea um, But uh, yeah, yeah, hopefully that, that's in there for you. Yeah, I, I hope, hope so. so. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and for the record, the fact that the only thing they had on draft was uh, in the dark beer category was the peanut butter milk stout is why I'm drinking cider. <laughs> 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 so, so I, I still remember what I was talking about. So, okay. never fear. So, so what we have That's is good. a sense in sense in which because we we and and what got me thinking about this is the story of Joseph, and I've talked about this before. Yeah. So, when we look at Joseph's story, because we say, "Hey, isn't it marvelous how Joseph's story is a is a this marvelous illustration of God's providence?" Uh, mm -hmm. We we just sort of stop learning from the story. Th other things that could be learned. That's like, right. example, uh, in my mind anyway, uh, how uh, big government enslaves everybody. <laughs> so, so in the story, of course, you know, Joseph is God's instrument to save his family and other people from this famine that's about to you know, ravage that part of the world. But did Joseph really have to push such a hard bargain on everybody. <laughs> now, think about what happens. So, you know, with each successive year that the famine goes on, uh, Joseph uh, requires the people who come for help uh, to exchange something for what, mm. right, is there yeah. in the storehouse. Yeah. And uh, eventually, uh, they run out of stuff to exchange for the food. By the way, exchange for stuff that's in the storehouse that 
they supplied that's to exact, the storehouse. That's exactly <laughs> right. For seven years, they gave 20%. And now, because it's Pharaoh's, uh, Joseph drives a hard bargain. And to the point where he drives the entire population, not just the Hebrews, I'm not talking about the Hebrews, I'm talking about the Egyptian population, uh, into servitude, uh -huh. indentured servitude. Mm. So anytime you think that the big guy, you know, we call the federal government or whatever you want to call it, is is going to provide you something for nothing. <laughs> Bailouts, what have you. You are deluded. There is a lesson to be learned in that story that does not have to do with providence sort of exclusively. It, I think, has to do with providence. I'm not saying it doesn't have something to do with providence. I'm not saying that it has nothing to do with, you know, the larger story of redemption. But I do think if you're looking for insight into the ways of the world and you're trying to, to, to grow wise, uh, if you're trying to, to, to understand how things work, there's a lesson to be learned, and that is uh, the man, big government, uh, is out to get as much of you as it can get. And that shows up in every story, doesn't it? I actually have this back in East Brewery quarter. I'll take that. that one? Sure. And I'll get you a new glass? Sure, that'd be great. Okay, so the uh, thank you. We got appreciate good news here. We got a porter here and a new glass coming. Anyway, so I, I took us on a little uh, detour. detour there, but uh, but I think it served the larger point, and that is that there are different things that are going on in Scripture. Right. There there are multiple layers there. Right. My favorite example is if you go to Chartres Cathedral. There's a window there that has the story of the fall in the garden, and it is combined with the story of the Good Samaritan. Hmm. And it turns out that you get the same pair of windows, and I think it's Durham, or the same pair of stories in a window, and I think it's Durham Cathedral, one of the cathedrals in, in uh, Britain. And uh, so the question is, why are those stories connected? And it has to do with the Venerable Bede. Okay. An English clergyman yeah. who provided an interpretation of the parable of the Good Samaritan. Mm. So the story of the fall in the garden and the expulsion from the garden, that's the problem. Mm -hmm. The story of the Good Samaritan is the solution. Now, it's got the literal meaning and who is my neighbor and all that kind of thing. But it's got a deeper meaning, according to B. And what he said is, a man leaves Jerusalem on his way to Jericho. Thank you. Jerusalem is representative of the city of God. It's right. therefore heaven. Right. Jericho is representative of the world. Therefore, the man who is leaving there is Adam. Hmm. He's really all of us, but it's fundamentally Adam. Right, right. And as he's on the road to Jericho, he's beset by robbers who beat him, strip him, and leave him half dead on the side of the road. Hmm. That's Satan and the fall. Right. The priest sees him and passes by on the other side, as does the Levite. That's the law and the prophets. Interesting. They can't save him. Yeah. The Samaritan comes along, that's Jesus. Mm -hmm. He provides him with basic first aid. He tends his wounds. He takes him to the inn, which is the church. Mm. He tends him there <laughs> and then pays the innkeeper and tells him to take care of him and I'll settle accounts when I return. Interesting, yeah, yeah. It's working so, for me, it's working for me. <laughs> so what he does is he takes the parable of the Good Samaritan completely out of its historical context. Right, right. But he turns it into the great story. Yeah, right. He right. turns it into a picture of the entire gospel. Yeah. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, the, the, the story of the Good Samaritan, uh, I, think, I think justifiably can be read in that way. I mean, because if, re, if, if reality really is layered as we're describing, then there is a kind of ethical dimension. Mm -hmm. There is a tropological dimension. You yeah. know, we're getting into all that stuff with that. And, right. and I do think that, you know, we have to do a little um, therapy on, if you will. <laughs> That's a, a Wittgensteinian term. Um, it, it, do a little therapy on the notion of historical sense, because I think it's been hyper-naturalized in, in the evangelical world in particular. And this has imported a, a Gnostic or naturalistic understanding of creation into our interpretive I love the combination of Gnostic and naturalistic. I do, too. I, that, that struck me as worth thinking about. It is, and it, strangely, I think they play into each other. I, I agree. Uh, I agree. And, and uh, maybe that's another 
show. It's just like monism and dualism play right right yeah. into each other. Yeah, yeah. Um, be- because what you end up doing is, yeah, hyper-spiritualizing on one end, but also um, gutting the creation from the kind of form that it has and the purposes it has. And so the, re- the resurrection of the flesh makes little sense. The rest, you know, the, the fulfillment of all things, the consummation of all things in Christianity makes little sense. But one of the things that, uh, that my, my point is, is I think the hyper-emphasis on fact and then fact interpreted as something accessible to historical methods rather than theo-historical methods, if you will, mm-hmm. theological historical methods, um, is, is a problem. I understand why it came about to make up for the lack of emphasis on the particular and the historical. Um, but I, my worry is it's become dis, um, disconnected from the, the, the transcendent yeah. and, and the true sen- uh, relation of transcendence to the creaturely. And therefore, what we end up doing is reading, reading history naturalistically and then interpreting the meaning mainly sociologically and, and not theologically. Right. I remember when I was uh, uh, working my bachelor's degree in theology, I, uh, I had a professor who's, who's described heresy as, as a truth uh, that has not been... Uh, Checked by or c- complemented by other truths. Yeah, yeah. So it's taking one thing and running with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And that, that's it... actually the root word. It comes from the Greek hydrain, which means to choose. Yeah, you pick yeah. one thing and yeah. you run with it. Yeah, say. yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think by making the historical, the 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 primitive level of meaning, um, but interpreting it in natural senses is, is also idolatrous because it is making. The, the, the ultimate reality from which all of history and creation is to be interpreted and read um, as something within the story rather than transcendent to it. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. I mean, th- there's a reason why Genesis sets up the metaphysical picture before it runs with the historical. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because if you don't get the uncreated, created relationship right, then you read the rest of the story the wrong way. Right. And this is why metaphysics... And redemptive history can never be severed. And this is what my, my issue with a lot of even contemporary reform people. They, they read redemptive history apart from its metaphysical implications right. from Scripture. Right. Yeah, they're, they're often, I think, uh, threatened by metaphysics. There's a, there's a sense in which they feel like metaphysics kind of gives license to fan, sort of fantastic, sort of imaginative sort of Well, here's why. Things. It's guilty of what they're doing with history. Okay. Because metaphysics can be severed from the true biblical metaphysic, just like history can be truly right. severed from the, the, the biblical understanding right. of redemptive history grounded in that metaphysic. What do I mean by this? What, when I say metaphysic, what I'm saying is Genesis sets up the reality picture from which you read history. History is not to be read merely as natural causes and particular realities. That's a part of it. That's part of its dignity, but it's not everything. Nominalism brought us the significance of the the particular, made that the whole meaning. And so what it did is it made the surface meaningful, but it had no depth. Classic Christianity, the depth was God's very determination of everything, which is involved with everything. I cannot be right now without God actually being the source of my beings. Therefore, I'm a dependent being. I'm not the reality from which I understand myself. God is. Same with history. Yeah, you we, cannot read history apart from the transcendental right. reference and, and, point. And, and, and if you're looking for some scripture folks who are mm-hmm. listening to back up what Tom just said, just read <laughs> Acts chapter 17, where Paul makes that very argument. Yep, yep. In him we live and move and have our being. being. And he's quoting a Stoic philosopher. philosopher. <laughs> you know, yeah. people don't realize that, but that's yeah. what he's doing. And, uh, and, and, and by the way, uh, the, uh, the home of... Uh, uh, Paul Tarsus yep. was a center of, guess what? Stoic philosophy. philosophy. It, was, it was renowned in the ancient world for that. And if you want to look at it from a different way, let's just take it to, you know, for all the theological heads out there, let's look at, look at it from, from our understanding of the doctrine of Christ. Okay, three gospels are telling us if you want to understand Christ and his mission, look at the historical lineage that he comes from, mm-hmm. all the way back to Adam, all okay. the way back to Abraham, all the way, you know, the different lineages. But John's gospel is going to give us something in addition. It says, if you want to understand all those other gospels, you've got to understand Jesus even prior to. That's and right. Jesus says, you want to understand yeah. what I'm up to, you can look at my works. Right. That should testify. 
but you need to know from whence I, from where I come from. Yep, and where I'm going. And that is before all creation, I already am, and I am in in fullness okay. of being with the Father, to which I want to return, and I long to return. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So hermeneutically, historically, you can't just look. Um, look. Um, Jesus asked the people who could experience him historically, he said, who do you say I am? Well, who do you say I am? Who do other people say I am? All of a sudden, he asked Peter, he said, who do you say I am? And he says, wait a minute, you're the son of the living God. He's blessed are you above all else. For flesh and blood, historical surface level didn't reveal this to you, but my father who's in heaven. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have the where Jesus is from that he reveals in the beginning Mm -hmm. to interpret the historical, then you have a large ability to get the historical wrong. Oh, you're Elijah. Oh, you're this. Right, oh, you're right, this. Right. But you're not. Um, you're not the son of the living God. That is something that's not available on the mere historical. Right. Now, right. there is no mere historical, and I think that's Glenn's point today. Right, right. But yet, we get the start of John's gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, which is a marvelous yeah. verse to reflect on at a number of levels. But it gets to your point. You know, we get the beginning, you know, uh, with the telling of the story of the Lord and Matthew with the yep. genealogy, the historical. That's right. And if you're going to read his historic manifestation, you have to see it in light of the theological before the historical redemptive. Right. right. Okay. I want to try to tie a couple of things together here. That'd be good because we're getting close <laughs> to the end of the show. Right. And we went so, a lot of places. Yeah. So uh, I, I, want to, I want to go back to even before Kill the Dragon and Get the Girl. Remember that? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I, and I, I'm going back to Tolkien's essay on fairy stories. Hmm. Right. And I think he has a paragraph in here that, you know, without the context, it's a little bit difficult at the beginning, but I think it speaks to the world we're in now. Um, this is what he said. Uh, he's quoting someone here. The rawness and ugliness of modern European life, that real life whose contact we should welcome, is the sign of a biological inferiority, of an insufficient or false reaction to the environment. This is guy's quoting. The maddest castle, then Tolkien continues, the maddest castle that ever came out of a giant's bag in a wild Gaelic story is not only much less ugly than the robot factory, it is also, to use a very modern phrase, in a very real sense, a great deal more real. Why should we not escape from or condemn the grim Assyrian absurdity of top hats or the Morlockian horror of factories? They are condemned even by the writers of the most escapist form of all literature, stories of science fiction. This is where it gets interesting. Yeah. These prophets often foretell, and many seem to yearn for, a world like one big glass-roofed railway station But from them, it is, as a rule, very hard to gather what men in such a world town will do. They may abandon the full Victorian panoply for loose garments with zip fasteners, but will use the freedom mainly, it would appear, in order to play with the mechanical toys in the soon cloying game of moving at high speed. To judge by some of these tales, they will still be lustful, vengeful, and greedy as ever, and the ideals of their idealists hardly reach farther than the splendid notion of building more towns of the same sort on other planets. <laughs> it is indeed an age of improved means to deteriorated ends. Yeah, right. Yeah. This is the vision of the Great Reset. Yes, right. It's mm. the vision of the Great Reset. And what mm. Tolkien is saying is we need to recover a different view of the world, a different vision of the world, which he sees found, founded primarily in these fairy stories. Mm-hmm. Now, we didn't get into his discussion of imagination and fantasy and what all these words technically mean. But basically what we're looking at is, you know, his solution is to see ourselves in a bigger world and to you, a bigger world than just the world of the here and now of facts and machines and and jobs and all of that sort of thing. It's it's to recognize that the common things of bread and wine and and the forest and the sunrise Mm. and the moon and all of these things point beyond themselves to something greater. It's the idea that we live in a world that is fundamentally sacramental, that points beyond itself to greater meanings, to greater realities, and that we are, in fact, where we are right now, participants in the great story. 
Yeah. And and that that what that means is that our lives matter. Our lives have real significance beyond just what we do in this world. Right. And once again, that we are where we are at this particular time, at this particular place in history, not by accident, but by design. Right. That God has designed and placed us where we are and designed our circumstances as he has to accomplish something bigger and greater than anything that we can possibly think or imagine. Right. And that's the message, I think, of Kill the Dragon, Get the Girl. That's the message of the fairy stories. That's the mes message of fantasy. And it's really the fundamental problem with the Great Reset and all these other things we see around us. It's a rejection of what is ultimately really real. Yeah, yeah. And that, yeah, I think that, and it goes back to that point about Bart. I mean, he, he fully understood that, that we, we're participating in the joy of Christ now. We're participating in the beatitude of God, even in our suffering and struggling. And so that is far more glorious than anything we may face by way of challenge. And in his, his analogy, of course, he loved Mozart. And he said, not because Mozart deserved it. He said, because Mozart assuredly did not deserve it. He was, he was a bit of a spoiled little brat. But here's a guy, despite his brathood, um, had the full bestowal of God's gift on him. And what he did in light of tragedy of the world and everything else is wrote music as if the world was infused with the larger reality of the joy that is central to, to the life of God. And so he could just sit there and flow over those notes and run with them unhindered, completely free, knowing that the tragic existed, but it didn't stop him from celebrating through, through his gift of music. You know, one of the things I think uh, that we see in our time that we might uh, find easy to dismiss as sort of uh, faddish is um, this, uh, this interest in ecology that we see that uh, has really captured the imagination of a lot of people. Now, there is a kind of apocalyptic kind of, uh, you know, sort of... Uh, I guess, pressure or, or energy that we, you know, have uh, expressed in the ecological sort of, you know, doomsday <laughs> prophets. But uh, I, I, I think that if anything that we, you know, if, if there's anything that we can draw out of it that, that I think is hopeful, it's a, a disillusionment with this mechanistic civilization that we find ourselves in mm -hmm. that uh, sees the purpose of life uh, as being you know something that as, as being something that can be sort of summed up with going faster than yesterday <laughs> no not getting not, not that we're going anywhere but we're getting there faster um, I think uh, there's something to to I think be encouraged uh, by with regard to this this phenomenon this uh, thing called the ecological movement and I think um, it doesn't go far enough, obviously. It doesn't, it doesn't see the meaning of creation. It just knows that creation is important. Mm -hmm. and, and they may not even be able, you know, many, many ecologists are not even willing to use the, the word creation when yeah. they speak of it. But they have a sense at a kind of gut level yeah. that this is important. Now, they'll try to justify their interest in it with, you know, well, we need to make sure that we take care of it because, after all, if we don't protect biodiversity, we'll be, you know, it'll harm our, our, our you know, the, the survival prospects of our descendants and stuff like that. You know, they'll, they'll try to reduce it to some kind of utilitarian, <laughs> you know, thing uh, that, the, that the ecological movement is, is serving. <laughs> but I don't really think that's, that's really what's driving these people. I think there's a kind of gut level sense mm -hmm. that creation is important and that we are its stewards. We are the stewards of creation. Yeah. And they need to go further. Now, I, I came across something today uh, that was encouraging to me. Uh, there's a guy named Paul Kingsnorth. I don't know if you've ever heard Never. of him. Mm. I just heard of him for the first time today. Mm. And uh, he's, a, uh, he's a writer. Mm. Um, Proofrock, that, uh, that daily yeah. newsletter that goes out. Um, uh, 
Mike uh, 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 Maddox uh, is the guy behind that. And uh, and it, by the way, if you have not subscribed to Proof Rock, you really should. It's a it's a it's a daily newsletter that comes in your in, you find it in your inbox and in your email every day, and uh, it's a it's a great resource. But uh, one of the things that uh, was in today's newsletter had to do with with this guy Kings North, and uh, he's a he's a novelist. And uh, he lives on the west coast of Ireland. Hmm. And uh, not only has he written some award-winning fiction, um, but he is a, a guy who has made his way back to the Christian faith hmm. and through the through ecology. <laughs> yeah. He's got a, a series of essays in a, 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 in a book called the Confessions. I think it's Confessions of a Former Ecologist. Uh. <laughs> In which he t- well, that's a book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, 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 just, I just ordered it. So we have to do, yeah, we have to do a show on that. Yeah, but 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 what but what he what I think you know his journey uh, sort of illustrates is what we're getting at here. He 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 knows that there's something wrong with the civilization that we live in. Yeah. He he turns to creation, which he thinks of as just nature in the raw. Yeah. yeah. And then he discovers that that's not enough. That mm-hmm. uh, there's something more going on here, and he yeah. digs deeper. And our our friend Rod Dreher mm. was actually uh, you know interviewed him, and mm. apparently had some positive influence on him. Mm. And now he identifies, he self-identifies. Yeah. There's a term. <laughs> he self-identifies as a Christian. Yeah. <laughs> uh, by the way, that's a that's oxymoronic. You don't self-identify as a Christian. You are identified <laughs> as a Christian yeah. by Christ. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, so this, 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 this journey, I think, is encouraging for us to think about. There are sometimes signs mm-hmm. of God's work in the world in places we don't think that God is at work. Yeah. You know, you know what I'm yeah. saying? And we, we, you know, we're kind of turned off by the nonsense that we see from the Gia people and you know, sort of the Earth First people That's and right. the nonsense and all this kind of stuff. And, and I think, I, I, to be fair, I think under that nonsense is that that recognition that creation speaks, but they don't have the, like Glenn says, the imagination, the imaginary resources to know how to yeah. to pull out. Maybe it's because this guy was a novelist or is a novelist well, that he was able to get at. There him. is there there are some th- there there are things like that, and I think that's where it stays. Is the the you know I mean I'll never forget uh, this is the, the, I'll, you know I don't want to run on with this, but I remember there was a friend of mine was a historian he was from Canada, but from uh, also his family was from uh, I think it was Estonia, and he was a young guy. He was twenty five doing his DPhil at Oxford. Brilliant young guy historian. He's writing on Soviet influence in some of those um, countries. He married a girl from Sweden. Well, anyway, they went on a little trip on their honeymoon to some isolated area of Wales. They were sitting in a pub, and they actually were listening in on the conversation. It wasn't all done in Welsh, but they were talking about the, one of the groups of people there were talking about seeing a fairy the other day. Wow. And they were talking about it not as a, <laughs> a story right, or a right. realm, but as something they actually encountered. Yeah, It's yeah. part of their imaginary, social right. imaginary, to use Charles Taylor's term. Yeah, right, you know? right, right. And right. so that stuff's not, not gone. Well, I remember hearing not too long ago about a protest in, in Iceland, of all places, uh, Iceland too. concerning a, a highway that was being laid in a particular part of the island and there was a protest because there was a ferry mound that Iceland's was going to be another place, yeah, that, another <laughs> that place was going to be there. disturbed by the by. Yeah. anyway we should wrap it up <laughs> um, anything you want to say as we conclude Glenn uh, I think I gave my closing speech already. <laughs> okay, and and I I think I think I've said everything I've got to say. How about you, Tom? Yeah, no, oh, no, a great topic, but I think we took it in a million directions. So <laughs> that's it's, what they pay us the big bucks for here at right. the Theology Podcast. <laughs> anyway, we they pay us big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> One. Why, day. Ha- why haven't I heard about this? <laughs> One day. <laughs> well, we appreciate those who listen, and we know that uh, uh, our audience is out there because uh, we get notes and texts and even phone calls and emails from you folks and we we appreciate you and we're glad that um, some folks out there you know are getting something out of the things the thing that we do here with the podcast every week anyway that's enough for now bye 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 now bye.